Well, good morning. It is a joy to be with you this morning. Ryan, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I've been praying for Redeemer Church for years and years, and so it's an absolute joy and delight to look out and see so many familiar faces uh, here. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, We do have six girls, ages 15 down to 7. I live in my own sorority. Pray for me. Uh, They are here this morning. I'll see if you can find them. Um, Go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. And we're going to be looking at uh, verses 1 through 7 this morning. And here's what I'm going to tell you today. When God calls us to walk through the fire... He promises to be with us. When God calls us to walk through the fire, He promises to be with us. It can happen so suddenly. At 8.46 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on September 11, 2001, hijackers crashed American Airlines Flight 11 into the North Tower of the World Trade Center instantly killing all 92 passengers and hundreds in the, in the building. 72, excuse me, 17 minutes later, hijackers crashed United Airlines Flight 175 into the World Trade Center South Tower, instantly killing all 65 passengers and hundreds in the building. 56 minutes later, the South Tower collapsed. 29 minutes later, the North Tower collapsed. Nearly 3,000 people were killed that day. Where do you turn in the face of disaster? Or perhaps it's more personal. Perhaps you go in for a regular physical and with one word, your whole world changes. Cancer. And the diagnosis hits you like a freight train and you're struggling to breathe. You're going to be going in and out of hospitals for months and the prognosis is uncertain. Where do you turn in the face of disease. Or perhaps you long to be married, but it's never happened, and the constant irritation is like a pebble in your shoe. Or or perhaps you come home one afternoon and you learn that your business partner has embezzled an enormous sum of money and you're teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Or you walk in one night and your spouse confesses that they're having an affair, and that the marriage is over. Or perhaps you learn yet again that another African-American male unarmed has been gunned down by police, and you wonder, when will this justice, injustice end? Where do you turn in the face of devastation? Or perhaps you've faced the greatest enemy. Perhaps you've lost your spouse of 50 years, and you know you'll be reunited with them in heaven, but you miss them now. Or perhaps you've had a pregnancy that's ended in miscarriage, and you still wonder, what would that child be doing right now? Or perhaps you have a parent nearing the end of their life, and memory after memory is being stolen away by Alzheimer's, and you grieve what seems to be an inevitable loss, or perhaps you don't know if your child is going to live through the week. Where do you turn in the face of death? When you face disaster, disease, devastation, and death, God says to us, my precious child, do not fear, for I am with you. As we come to our text this morning, let me give you a little bit of context. Isaiah 40 through 66 anticipates the Babylonian captivity after the fall of Judah in 586 BC and brings comfort and encourages a new exodus and a return home to the promised land. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. But now, thus says the Lord... He who created you, O Jacob, 
He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence this morning, there are some here who are carrying heavy burdens. There are some here who are walking through the fire now. And there are others who have scars. And there are others who will walk through the fire. Father, I pray that as we focus our attention this morning on Isaiah chapter 43, that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of your gospel and through the work of your Holy Spirit and through the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins. May we see Jesus and him only. Amen. There's an imperative, a sort of command that controls our text this morning. And it shows up in verses 1 and 5. Do not fear. Do not fear. Or in the ESV, it's fear not. But it's not so much a command for us to summon up our bravery as it is an assurance that God will care for us when he calls us to walk through the fire. And so this morning we're going to look at when not to fear and then how not to fear. When not to fear and then how not to fear. So first of all, when not to fear. Look with me at verse 2. When you pass through the waters... I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Notice the metaphors here. Waters and rivers and fire. These are metaphors of hardship and tragedy. And the first two metaphors are metaphors of deliverance through a difficult ordeal. So pass through the waters probably refers to that time in the Exodus when Israel passes through the Red Sea. Do do you remember the scene there in Exodus, right? God has delivered his people out of Egypt and through through the ten plagues. And there they are. They're, They're moving forward and they run into the Red Sea. And Pharaoh changes his mind and brings the mightiest army on the face of the earth. And he's pursuing the Israelites. And then in the midst of that scene... In, in Exodus chapter 14, Moses stands up and says to all the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. It's a metaphor of deliverance through a difficult ordeal. And through the rivers probably refers to the time that Israel crosses the Jordan River into the Promised Land. It's Joshua chapter 3. And Joshua tells all the people, when the soles of the feet of the priests who are carrying the ark 
step on the bed of the river Jordan, the river will stop and Israel will walk through on dry land. And their feet does, and the river stops, and Israel walks through on dry land, pass through the rivers. And those two items, passing through the waters and passing through the rivers, serve as an inclusio as God brings his people out of slavery, out of bondage, and takes them into the promised land. They're metaphors of deliverance through a difficult ordeal. But then there's a metaphor of judgment. You see, walk through the fire in its context seems to be an image of judgment. If you look back at Isaiah chapter 42, you'll notice that in verse 18, Israel is described as blind and deaf. And they're described as blind and deaf in verse 18 because in verse 17, they're worshiping molten images. They're worshiping idols. And so then the judgment comes. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 25. So he, that is God, poured out on him, that is Israel, the heat of his anger. Do you hear the image of fire here? And the might of battle. It set him on what? Fire all around. But he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. So fire seems to be an image of judgment. This is, after all, how Jesus describes hell. So Isaiah is telling us that here in Isaiah 42, he's telling us that hardship can come as a consequence of our actions. It can be judgment, but hardship can also be deliverance through a difficult ordeal. And while those are two very different kinds of hardship, in our, in our text this morning, Isaiah seems to lump them together for his purposes. But whatever the hardship, I want you to notice the certainty of hardship. Did you catch that there in verse 2? When you pass through the waters. When you walk through fire. It, it's not if. It's not a possibility. It's a reality. God is telling us that in this life, trials and hardship will come. You will face disaster, disease, devastation, and death. It's inevitable. And there's a certain comfort in having that truth. God is preparing your souls in advance for the trials and hardship that will come. And so when it comes, you can know that it's coming from His hand. But I also want you to know the duration of hardships. Notice the duration of hardships here in verse 2. It's pass through the waters. It's walk through the fire. Those aren't actions that depict brevity. It's a process. It's a journey. Sometimes those hardships will only last a couple of days, but sometimes those days will turn into weeks, and those weeks will turn into months, and those months will turn into years. Have you been there? Are you there now? In the midst of the long, hard heartache of hardship, the imperative of verse 1 and 5 breaks in, and God says, My child, do not fear. But if you've been there, if you've tasted the hardship that God promises in this life, you know it's not easy. Fear creeps in when you walk through the fire. And so the question really is this, how do we do that? How do we not fear? When it feels like you're drowning in the hardships of life, how do you keep pressing ahead? When you can smell the smoke and you feel the heat, how do you keep walking through the fire? So that brings us into how not to fear. God gives us four tender assurances when we walk through the fire. Four tender assurances. And the first assurance that I want us to see this morning is that He has created us and called us. He has created us and called us. Verses 1 and verse 7. You see, when we're walking through the fire, 
there can be a certain desperation. You see it in the Psalms all the time. God, do you see me? Do you see my suffering? Do you see my pain? Do you see my agony? When will it end? Lord, have you forgotten me? Have you abandoned me? Have you forsaken me? Oh God, do you see me? John Oswald says, Much can be endured if we have a sense of destiny born out of a particular identity. Strip that identity away from us, and we think that going on in life is hardly worth it. What is that identity that keeps you walking when God calls you to go through the fire? He gives us that identity in verse 1 and verse 7. Isaiah 43, 1, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And as he's gathering his people, he gathers in verse 47, excuse me, verse 7, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. So at the beginning and at the end of this salvation oracle, God reminds us of our identity. He created us. It's there in verse 1. He who created you, he who formed you. Or in verse 7 it said this way, whom I created, whom I formed. But it's not only that he created us, but it's also that he calls us. And he calls us in two different ways. In verse 1, he calls us by name. He calls us by name. That is, he knows us intimately. He knows your favorite kind of ice cream and what you were doing at 9.03 a.m. this morning. And he knows how many hairs are on your head. And he knows your name. And he calls you by your name. But then in verse 7, it says this, everyone who is called by my name. You see the difference? Here in verse 7, God is calling us by His name. How do you get somebody else's name? Well, most commonly we see that today how? Through, through marriage, right? Where the, the bride takes on the identity of the groom by taking on His name. And through that, she's showing her complete union and her identification with the groom. But it also happens through adoption, right? Where the adopted child takes the surname of its new family to show that it belongs, that that child belongs to that family. Do you see what God's saying here? He's saying, you are a part of my family. He's saying, you are my child. Look at verse 1. I have called you by name. You are mine. When God calls us to walk through the fire, He calls us by name. And He says, you belong to me. You are my child. And He's giving us there the assurance of parental love. In Buffalo, New York, on February 19th, 2016, Demetrius Johnson rushed into a burning house to save his eight-year-old daughter and his one-year-old son. And he realized when he came out of the house that his three-year-old son was still in the burning building. And they told him, don't go in, it's too dangerous. And he said, I'm not going to let my son die. And he rushed back into the house. And he died trying to save his son. And that's the logic of parental love. It's an instinct that's inside all of us. We would sacrifice our life to save our child. And when you walk through the fire, God says, I have called you by name. You are mine. You are my child. He created us and called us. The second assurance when you walk through the fire this morning that God gives us in Isaiah is that He has redeemed us and ransomed us. He has redeemed us and ransomed us. Verses 1 and then 3 and 4. Look back at verse 1. Why should we not fear? 
The first thing that he says is, fear not for what? For I have redeemed you. I have redeemed you. What does it mean that he's redeemed us? It means that he's bought us back, that he's paid a price, that we belong to him because he has purchased us and bought us back to himself. And he unpacks that further in verses 3 and 4. What does it mean that we're redeemed, that we're bought with a price? Look at Isaiah 43 and verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now stop for a minute right there. Notice how God identifies himself. He identifies himself as your God of Israel, your Savior. John Oswald says, as much as Israel is the Lord's, just so much is the Lord's Israel's. You see, here's the remarkable thing about a covenant. It's not just that we belong to God. It's that God is giving himself completely and utterly to us. He belongs to us. Keep reading in verse 3. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. So here we have the idea of ransom that's introduced, and it helps explain the idea of redeemed. Now, there's a debate among commentators around the specifics, but the meaning here is clear. John Oswald says, For God, no price is too high to pay for the redemption of his own. No price is too high to pay for the redemption of his own. He would go to any length to find a substitute for them. And ultimately, of course, how has this worked out? It's worked out that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God, that he laid down his life as what? A ransom for many. You see, it wasn't ultimately Egypt and Cush and Seba that God gave in exchange for you. It was his son, his only son, the son of his love, that he gave as a ransom price so that you could belong to him. Isn't that a glorious truth? But do you know why he did that? Keep reading. Look at verse 4. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. We're precious and honored and loved. If you stop and think about it for a minute, isn't that what we all want to hear? Isn't that one of the deepest longings of our heart to know that we're precious and honored and loved? And isn't it a glorious thing to be precious and honored and loved to your spouse or, or to a friend or, or to a family member? But do you notice here who's loving you that way? It's God himself. When you walk through the fire, God says, I have loved you so much that I have redeemed you with the ransom price of my son. He redeemed us and ransomed us. The third assurance when you walk through the fire is this. He will be with us, and one day we will be with him. He will be with us, and one day we will be with him. And we see this in verses 2 and 5 and 6. Look at verse 2. When you pass through the waters, what? I will be with you. Verse 5. Do not fear, for I am with you. You see, it's not just that he's created us and called us by name. It's not just that he's redeemed us and ransomed us. But here's the great consolation of suffering. God meets us in our suffering. Yes, it's true that he's always with us. Right? But he meets us in our suffering, in a way that we don't experience him in everyday life. And if you've been there, perhaps you've seen this. C.S. Lewis says, God whispers in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. 
And Tim Keller says, you don't know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. The promise of God's presence in our suffering means this. God will walk through the fire with us. And he gives us a picture of that. About 150 years after Isaiah, there's a picture of God walking through the fire. Do you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3? Right? In Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar issues a decree that whenever the horn sounds, all of the people are supposed to bow down and worship this image that he's erected of himself. And if they don't bow down and worship that image, they're going to be cast into the furnace of blazing fire. And the day comes and the horn sounds and everyone bows and worships except for three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're not going to bend the knee. And Nebuchadnezzar is so outraged by this indignance that he has the furnace heated to seven times its normal heat, and he has them thrown in. And then something remarkable happens. He looks into the fiery furnace, and he sees men walking around in the fire, and they're unhurt. And it's a literal fulfillment of Isaiah 43, 2, that when you walk through the fire, the flame shall not consume you. But do you remember? It's not three men walking around in the fire. It's four. And do you remember what Nebuchadnezzar says? He says, the appearance of the fourth was like a son of the gods. But perhaps better on this side of redemptive history, we can say, but the appearance of the fourth was the Son of God. Do you see? Jesus is telling us that when you walk through the fire, He is going to walk through the fire with you. May that be a picture that sticks in our hearts so that when we experience hardship, we remember who Jesus is, that He is walking through the fire with us. But there's a future component here too. It's not just that he's walking through the fire with us now, but it's also that one day we will be with him. Notice the language of gathering in verses 5 and 6. I will bring up your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. This is an image of God gathering his people to himself at the end of time. You see, Jesus walking, with the fi- walking through the fire with you now is just a down payment. It's a promise. You see, if Jesus is walking with you through the fire now, it means that one day he's going to call you and he's going to take you home to live happily ever after. If Jesus is walking through the fire with you now, then one day all of these trials and hardships will fade. They're temporary. They're fleeting. If Jesus is walking through the fire with you now, it means that one day all of this will be a distant memory and it will fade into the past. And you'll turn and you'll look your Savior full in the face and you'll see His love and the adventure of glory that waits for you for the rest of eternity. One day, He will take you home to live happily ever after. And that's a promise that you can bank on. He is with us and one day we will be with Him. And the fourth assurance when you walk through the fire is this. It's all for His glory. It's all for His glory. Look at verse 7. Everyone whom I call, who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. When we walk through the fire, God tells us, I'm shaping you for my glory. He created us in His image. He created us for glory. And in the fire, He's refining us. He wants to make us more like Him. He wants to conform us more and more to His image. 
A young boy once approached a goldsmith who was working over a fire. And the young boy saw that the goldsmith was working with gold. And so he came up to the goldsmith and asked, what are you doing? And the goldsmith replied, I'm refining this gold. I'm going to make something beautiful with it. And the young boy asked, isn't the fire dangerous? Oh, yes, replied the goldsmith. But I'll watch it closely the whole time. What does the fire do? asked the boy. It burns off all the impurities, replied the goldsmith. Isn't there another way? asked the boy. There isn't, said the goldsmith. This is necessary. Will it take long? asked the boy. Sometimes, said the goldsmith. It's a process. How will you know when it's done, asked the boy, when I see my image in it, said the goldsmith. Tim Keller says this, if you believe in Jesus and you rest in him, then suffering will relate to your character like fire relates to gold. Brothers and sisters, when God calls us to walk through the fiery furnace of disaster, disease, devastation, and death, do not fear, for he has created us and called us. He has redeemed us and ransomed us. He is with us, and one day we will be with him, and it's all for his glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you have sent your only begotten Son as the ransom price for our lives and for our hearts. Thank you that when you call us to walk through the fire, that you walk through the fire with us, that we feel your everlasting arms wrapping around us. Father, I pray for those who are hurting, who are grieving, who are in the fiery furnace now. Would you be with them? I pray for those who have scars, and I pray that you would bind up their wounds. And I pray for those who will be in the fire. Would you give them the courage not to fear because of your presence with us? And I ask this in the name of Jesus who walks through the fire with us. Amen and amen.